podcast called uh, Dove Jelly Slim Podcast. He probably doesn't remember this at all. Get yeah, record together. It's easy. This is kind of real. Like, holy shit. And so it's really cool to get to be a part of that. Hey, you know how this goes. Hey, when you... You now tune into the biggest ever. When I hit you to take part, when I hit to take over. <laughs> I don't remember that. That's crazy. What's up, everyone? We're back with episode 170 of the Dub Johnson Podcast. Today, have a very special guest, Mr. Eddie Gill. Eddie, how are you? I'm good. Uh, thank you for having me. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, I know you're you're a very busy man, so I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, I mean, talk about all the all the things that you got going on right now. With I know you do broadcasting and and your job and 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 various other little projects on the side as well. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, from a day-to-day standpoint, I'm, I'm with Wise Financial and Northwestern Mutual uh, in a lead advisor role. Comprehensive financial planning is, is, is what we do. And um, I've been in this business for a little more than eight years now. Um, and then on the basketball side, obviously doing some some uh, some TV and radio stuff with the Pacers. Um, and then they open up the, the 19th of this month. So that'll start my seventh year. It's, it's hard to believe that I've been doing it for seven years now, but uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, they've been incredibly uh, gracious to me, affording me this opportunity, and, and, and it's been fun. So um, doing that and then also uh, just trying to do as much community work and, and philanthropic work as possible. Um, so those are kind of things. That, that's the short story, Yeah. Uh, but having fun doing it all. Yeah, because I know you do, like, camps down in Indy and, and a lot of things like that. I mean, what, what made you want to start doing those? Um, well, while I was playing, you know, this goes all the way back to my collegiate days. You know, one of the things that a, a lot of programs and, and especially on the NBA level trying to do is get back into the community. So a lot of those uh, involve uh, youth-based camps, uh, basketball skill development stuff. So uh, developed a passion for that early on, you know, in my time, you know, both professionally and again, collegiately. And then, uh, you know, once I got out of that, that space in terms of my playing career, I wanted to still be able to uh, provide those resources and, and, and continue to, to work with the kids when, when I first uh, kind of retired. So I was able to do that and, and periodically do a little bit of it still. Hmm. And a lot of, I mean, not just basketball, but even baseball and football, a lot of the athletes that I have on, especially if they're not playing anymore, they talk about like it's it's hard for some of you guys to to find those things that you're passionate about outside of just basketball. I mean, what was that process kind of like for you? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's definitely a, a significant transition from from playing for so many years, almost you know more than half of my life, you know, being on a basketball court and and twelve years of those trying to make a making a living of it, uh, at it. So um, it's definitely a significant transition. Uh, personally, I had uh, and I do have two children. They both were playing basketball at the time, so that keeps me tied into the game and, and actually found more joy uh, kind of watching them do their thing uh, throughout their uh, upbringing, whether it was middle school, high school, and that kind of thing. They both went on to play collegiately. Um, so those things were, were, were helpful for me. And then obviously this opportunity with the Pacers, you know, still some TV and radio stuff it still keeps me tied to the game. Uh, but definitely nothing's like, you know, preparing for a season, going through training camp, going through your practices, playing a, an entire season and being able to do that for 12 straight years professionally uh, was definitely a joy for me. Um, but but nothing compares to doing that for sure. And what was that first year like where you where you hung them up and, and you weren't going to training camp, you weren't uh, going overseas to get ready for a season? I mean, what was that like? Did, were you just sitting at the house like, I don't know what, like th- this feeling is so weird. Yeah, it was it was definitely strange, um, but I, I did enjoy the time that I was able to get, you know, with, with family and, and friends and, and that kind of thing that, um, you know, you just don't you just don't get to do as much, you know, while you're playing. Um, so and but not having to having that schedule was, was definitely different. Um, not being paid to stay in shape uh, is definitely different. You know what I mean? So. Um, you know, I had to find some internal motivation over these last 10 years or so, just continually, to, you know, just working out, like simple things like that. Um, you know, you just kind of take for granted. It was just something that was just part of your everyday regimen because, you know, you can't go out there and, and perform at a high level if conditioning isn't there. So 
that was just something that was just embedded in me at that point. So um, now there's no reason to, to, to do that except for just health health reasons, right, which are good. You know, you want to be able to stay healthy and, and in shape and that kind of thing. So um, a lot of different uh, situations there that are, that are completely different, you know, in terms of preparing for a professional season. And was there a year or, or moment where you were like, all right, I need to start start thinking about when the ball stops bouncing? Um, I would say probably my last couple of years, you know, in and out of the NBA, going overseas, that kind of thing. My kids were getting older, um, and and there's certain things that you just miss, you know, if you're playing professional basketball, just by due to the due to the travel, and especially if, I'm, if you're going internationally, and that's what, what I was doing towards the tail end of my career, and um, it just came to a point where I just decided, hey, I don't want to miss anymore, right? You know, my my kids were, I believe, eleven and nine at the time, and um, and my son is the oldest one, and I just felt like it was important for me to be around him, you know, 24 hours a day, you know, to, so to speak. And, uh, and you know, it was just a decision that I made. I, I probably could have went on and continued to play another three, four, five years internationally uh, or maybe try to get back into the NBA. But um, I just decided that it was it was, it was was time to, to get that done. And a lot of people think that international basketball, overseas basketball, there's kind of like a stigma surrounding it. What was that? experience like for you going traveling the world being able to play the game that you love yeah I look at it as a blessing it was uh, I tell people my kids saw most of the world before they were 10 <laughs> um, and you know they've seen more of the world than most people see in their lifetime uh, just you know the different places we were able to go and visit and um, you know it, it's definitely an adjustment right we're looking at a language barrier in some places where obviously the food and things that you've grown accustomed to growing up, you, you don't have the access to that, um, you know, TV, that the, the shows that you watch, those types of things, being able to have constant communication with your family, both immediate and extended, um, you know, and just being able to survive in a different culture and not only survive, but be able to find a way, a, a, a position to thrive in, in a different culture, uh, experience those different things, those different life lessons that you're able to to, to have during, throughout, throughout the, all those experiences, you know, that was, um, you know, a, it was a real challenge at sometimes, but also at the end of the day, I look back at it and I was like, you know, I was fortunate enough to have those experiences. Now, where was a place where you got there, you're getting ready for the season, you look around, you're like, what the hell is going on? I don't know anything about this. I'm just so lost. Yeah, I would say probably Moscow. Um, I, I went to Moscow for um, for a year a season. It was actually I played my two seasons with the Pacers. I, I was on two year deal there, um, and then went over to, to Russia for a year. Um, so that was probably the biggest uh, difference, you know, in, in terms of just trying to figure things out. Um, again, both, both culturally, language barrier, uh, and those kind of things. So that was a that was a different experience. And what what advice will you give to guys who maybe are bouncing between overseas and the NBA or even the G League now um, about setting themselves up for success. Uh, like I mentioned, like the ball stop, when the ball, when the ball stops bouncing, excuse me. I would say um, leverage your celebrity while you can. And, and that's in an appropriate way. It doesn't mean you go out here abusing relationships, taking advantage of people or anything like that. But there's a lot of folks that look at professional athletes in general uh, as celebrities. They would like to be, Kind of be in their network and 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 not just take advantage of them. Um, there there is some of that. You got to be cautious and make sure you do your due diligence on certain people. But be open to conversations. Um, I would say have some conversations with with folks that are not necessarily in your immediate network. Uh, looking at there may be some business opportunities. Start brainstorming about things that you that you like, you're passionate about, or things you want to have an impact with, and maybe have some sort of business opportunity there as well. But um, all the while, there's there's a support system out there um, if you if you go about it the right way and be able to set yourself up to where you may be able to get some things in place while you're still playing. Um, and definitely, once you're done playing, you you have opportunities, and, and it's not like okay, I start from scratch day one uh, without any type of business network, uh, regardless of the industry. You know, once you retire. And I'm glad you brought that up about kind of using your celebrity. <clears throat> one of my good friends, Rayfeld Davis, played at Purdue. Um, I try to I try to tell him this, and I think he's understanding it more now. Um, 
more and more now because he's kind of within Purdue, but he's not um, obviously not playing anymore. Especially when you go to a, a Big Ten school or even if you play in the NBA, people love you. You're gonna get recognized mm-hmm. when you get when you're going out to eat, when you go to the store, wherever. People mm-hmm. look up to you and and you have a bigger impact on them from a fan's perspective than than I think that a lot of athletes really realize. Yeah, no, totally. I, I couldn't agree more. And you don't necessarily have to go on to play professionally. Obviously, there's only but so many jobs available and, and that's, there's a small um, segment of, of, of athletes or collegiate athletes that go on to play professionally. Uh, but even collegially, you reference that like Big Ten, that's that's oh, that's equivalent to the NFL in some cases when you're talking about some of these programs uh, um, and Purdue was right there with them. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of different opportunity to, to go out and network and meet people and, and, uh, and again, just create some relationships. Whether something comes from it, uh, you know, from a monetary value or, or, or a business value, you know, immediately or not, that's, I don't think that's necessarily the thing that you're looking for. The instant gratification, I think, is, is, is something that you kind of push to the side, but ultimately it can pay dividends down the road when you have some of these relationships in place. Uh, because again, you know, even on that, on that level, and, you know, I went to Weber State University, a, a mid-major school, even on that level, there's folks that, that really want to be able to support you and, and be able to, uh, you know, provide some opportunity down the road. And not only that, it's just, a, you know, it's just the right thing to do. Right? If we can, if we can um, do right by each other just because without any uh, sort of agenda behind it, I think great things can happen for you anyway. Mm-hmm. And like you mentioned, Weber State, there's people that went to school at the same time. You, you guys had that magical uh, upset over North Carolina. You guys come in contact and they're a CEO of a business. There's a connection right there. And they're like, you did this for me. You gave me that special feeling. So now I want to try to return the favor. Yeah, yeah absolutely. There's, uh, there's, just, there's just plenty of opportunity there to, to, to build those relationships. Um, and yeah, that was, that was obviously a, a unique moment. And history, and it's one I won't forget for sure. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're about halfway through. I wanted to transition to the Pacers. Obviously, um, after the last few years, it felt like the team was kind of stagnant, but people had higher expectations for them. Not not saying like NBA Finals expectations, but at least making it to the playoffs now full it's it's a full rebuild um do you think some of those stresses for the franchise to have to have to produce and get to the playoffs this year are kind of relieved at least for this season uh i would say externally right i, I, I would say from a fan perspective right the, the the expectations may have been tempered to some degree because we do have a young team and, and, and not a lot of experience and, and those types of things a lot of times when you have that uh the external expectations may go down to some degree but I, um, I've been in those types of locker rooms. I can tell you, uh, those 15 guys that are that are playing and putting the uniform on and the coaching staff, they have high expectations for themselves, right? They want to they go want to go out there and compete at a super high level. Um, they they haven't gotten this far in their professional careers by thinking less than of themselves, right? So they, they I'm sure they have playoff aspirations. They want to play prove everyone wrong and uh, and go out there and compete at a, at a super high level, but. Yeah, I, I would just say outside of that locker room, yeah, probably the expectations have been tempered to some degree, and, and maybe rightfully so. What do you think those realis- realistic expectations should be for, for this version of the Indiana Pacers? I think just being able to compete every night. Uh, I think that's a realistic expectation. And some of those things, you know, some of those uh, attributes have nothing to do with uh, making shots or making mistakes or, you know, how fast you run, how high you jump, some of those things. If we can just go out and compete at a super high level um, and, and worry about the intangibles, really think about what your process is in terms of dedication to film, dedication to to, to workouts, dedication to what you're doing on, on the practice floor. And uh, you go out there and compete on game nights. I think good things can happen for you uh, when you talk about an 82-game season. Yeah, and the Pacers are in a weird spot now. I mean, I forget what the st- how many years it's been since they had a top ten pick, um, but like twenty, thirty, yeah, like super long time. 
and they have young pieces like Tyrese Halliburton and, and Ben Matherin and even the vets like Buddy Heel coming in. Um, and then Miles Turner, obviously, kind of the – I feel like the heart and soul of the team. Um, could you see them having a breakout year if if things fall um, fall in the right thing? Do you mean a reference to, the, to the, some of the young guys? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, a, a player's dream is significant opportunity, right, to go out there and play their game with great confidence, not looking over their shoulder, thinking about, hey, if, I'm gonna, if I make a mistake, am I going to be – pulled out of the game or these types of things. So I think a lot of these young guys that you referenced, a handful of them, they're going to get significant opportunity, right? Re regardless of whether they're making mistakes or not. Now, obviously, they'll want to limit those and, and, and follow scouting reports and those types of things. Um, but ultimately, they, they are, are going to get significant opportunity. And, and with that opportunity comes confidence, uh, they gain confidence, and then ultimately, you look to see improvement um, from a result standpoint. So you could definitely some guys see some see some guys have real breakout years or you know threaten to be uh, uh, be in that all star conversation that kind of thing just by virtue of the opportunity that they have and also that they're capable. Mm. And I think the the success of the pitchers kind of pins on Ben Mather and how he looks in his rookie year. I don't I don't think he needs to come out and be a world beater, but like I feel like the Pacers need that guy that fills that Paul George. Victor Oladipo role, and they haven't had that over the last couple of years ever since Oladipo kind of got hurt. Yeah, it would be nice to have a guy like that, right? <laughs> you know, Paul George is probably a top 15 player. Uh, Victor, at, at his height, was, you know, he's a top 15, top 20 player for sure. Um, so to, to put those types of uh, expectations on a couple of these guys now may be a little bit lofty, mm -hmm. uh, but you potentially see that down the road. But they do have a nice young – I mean, obviously we need to see what, like I said, Matherin does. But Halliburton, I don't think he's going to be like the guy that is the leader of a of an NBA Finals team, NBA Championship team necessarily, uh, just the way he plays. But, like, I mean, you need guys like him in order to win in the league. Yeah, there's no question about it. I could see uh, him being a guy who's in their 18 to 20-point range. And, and he'll be up there and assist. I can see him very easily being one of the assist leaders throughout the season. Uh, just by virtue of them getting up and down, he's going to be the primary ball handler when he's on the floor. Uh, so he's going to create a lot of opportunities for his teammates to score. So he, he's one that was a, you referenced earlier. He could definitely have a breakout season this year. Mm -hmm. And who are some of the guys that may, maybe like a Jalen Smith who showed some flashes last year, Isaiah Jackson, or even Chris Doherty? Um, who dealt with some injuries last year. Who are some of the guys that you think could make a, a big jump and surprise a lot of people? Uh, I think Isaiah Jackson is going to make a, make a big jump. You, you, re you reference him. I, I think that some of the things that kind of got him in trouble was just his youth, right? Uh, you know, just a couple seasons ago, that guy was playing AAU basketball, right? <laughs> it, and, and now he's in his second year in the NBA. So um, he's going to see some major growth not only this year, but seasons to come. But I think he can really uh, make a, a a definite big jump in a positive direction because ultimately he can just do things that m most guys can't do uh, from an athletic standpoint. And and the, the quicker he understands the NBA game, understands the nuances, how to use his, his athleticism in, in, in a way that, that supports what he does, uh, he can make a pretty big jump. All right. I, this is a little off topic, but – I'm assuming you saw Victor um, Wimb Wimbanwana. I for, I, sorry if I messed up his name, but that yes. 7 4 kid from France. Oh my goodness gracious. I've never seen anything like that. Yeah, I, I, I didn't see the game, but I did see some highlights, and he looks pretty special. Uh, it, you know, he, is, he looks really special in, in terms of his ability to move, uh, knock down open jump shots, he can handle the basketball. Clearly, with his height, he can protect the rim. Um, yeah, the, he doesn't have a ceiling. <laughs> when you were in the league, and like one of those guys comes in, maybe not, maybe not like a unicorn like him, but a guy coming into the league that's a rookie. Do you look at him, them, and be like, "Oh, okay, they're they're legit." Yeah, that was LeBron. Uh, that was that was <laughs> probably LeBron when uh, I was probably in my fourth or fifth year, I think, something like that, sixth year maybe. 
um, when he first got into the league his rookie year. And it was just, you know, he was – his body was ready. His, his speed, obviously, his athleticism was, was second to none. And um, his ability to pass the basketball, there was no, you know, there's nothing he can't do um, even at that time. And, and to be able to take that team – that he had in Cleveland early on in his career, all the way to the finals, you, you knew that he was ready. Now, aside from LeBron, I don't, I don't know if you ever got to play against Mike. Um, who are some of the best guys you played against? Because I know if, if you did play against Mike and and like LeBron, I mean those two are the top two ever, maybe. You know, as I was first coming in, uh, Jordan was on his way out. I caught him when he was with the Wizards. I'm pretty sure it was his last year. So obviously. That's not the version that, of, of Michael Jordan that everyone knows and, and loves. But um, it was still a pretty surreal moment to, to be able to, you know, be out there and, and that kind of thing. But um, but in terms of guys that I, I played against, you know, at their peak, um, probably like Allen Iverson was the guy who was, was at the peak of his game when, when, when I was um, in the league playing against him and that kind of thing. So, um, he's a special one. Like, you know, he was a special one. Tracy McGrady was a special one. Um, there's a, there's a number of guys, you know, in each generation that that come along, and they're just uh, they have special talent, special motor, and, and a special you know just a special ability to get it done. Now, Allen Iverson, he's I think he in the grand scheme of the NBA and the sport of basketball, he's so underrated for what he he changed the culture in a way. Um, and then I wish he was, I wish he was a rookie in 2020, 2021 doing the things that he was doing because he he might have scored 35 a game. Yeah, he was one of definitely, you know, was part of the <laughs> revolution of the game with his with his ability to score and, and, and play free and uh, play in transition and, and just, uh, you know, obviously ultimate competitor and, and aggression. Uh, and, and I'm partial to, to, to small guys, right? So he's, he was a little guy out there getting it done. So it was, it was, it was pretty cool to play against him too. Do you think he's the best little guy ever in the NBA? Um, quote unquote little guy. Obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm with you. He's in the conversation for sure. I'd have to give it some thought before I completely crown him that. Uh, because there's some there's some other guys you go know, back in the day that were that were pretty special as well. Um, but uh, yeah, he's in that conversation for sure. What do you think? Some of those guys. Uh, maybe even in the early 2000s, kind of when you broke into the league, do you think their styles would have translated to to today's game? I know on sports talk radio and and things like that, everyone's like, "Oh, LeBron couldn't play in this area." In this era, some of the guys of yesteryear couldn't play in this era. Do you think that? I mean, those top guys they could play in any era. I would say so. Uh, for the most part, most of the most of the uh... Most of them, uh, I would say, could probably survive and, and thrive in, in, in each in each era. Um, having said that, I, I also think that the game is is improving. Right? I think guys are getting far more skilled. They're uh, super athletic. Um, every all five guys on the floor almost now can step out and shoot threes. Um, you know, their skill the, the game is improving. I, I do think that the, the skills of the game have improved in terms of. Um, the amount of guys who can do a certain amount of things, right? You know, back in the day, I feel like there was probably, you know, a handful of guys who could do everything, right, mm -hmm. uh, at, a, at a high level. And, and now you have a, a significant amount of guys who can shoot, pass, dribble, run, jump, you know, they, they can do all these different things. So the game, I, I definitely think the game is improving um, all the while. Now, now, granted, there's some give and take in terms of the style of play, uh, both, you know, whether it is back in the day and what's going on now. So the, those are there's an evolution in, in style of play, but um, I would I would say overall there's been improvement, especially when you're talking about the skill set. Now, now you mentioned both of your children um, went on to play collegiate sports. Did you see the way that the NBA is played and basketball is played now professionally? Do you see that lingering into um, like AAU and and the and the younger generation because Every so often you'll see a, a video on Twitter or something where like AAU just doesn't look the same as it used to. Kids are like doing it, kind of doing it for show now. And I know that's part of the NIL deal and, and all that stuff. But how much of what's going on in the NBA and the game changing 
um, kind of lingers down to the younger generation and and that you've experienced? Yeah, sometimes when I, I talk to um, kids, whether in middle school or high school, I, I tell them the NBA is a gift and a curse, right? Because uh, you watch Steph Curry, for example, a guy stepping across half court and he's letting it go, and that's a good shot for him. Um, but a lot of times kids don't understand the amount of hours and the countless reps that went into him having the confidence to take and make those shots on a consistent basis. And, you know, Damian Lillard, there's a number of guys who are, who are taking these types of shots and, and making them on a regular basis, but, um, or step backs or just not fundamentally, fundamentally sound moves or things like that, that guys are able to just do routinely because they've worked on them. So, so many different times you see, uh, in youth basketball, middle school, or high school, you reference AAU basketball. Sometimes you see kids tr attempting some of these things, but they haven't put in countless hours required to to get that done. So, um, so there's definitely some of that that's going on to it. But having having said that, I think it's it's good to, to have um, kids trying new things and, and, and feeling confidence. And you know, so there's a there's a balance there because I think the confidence level has grown, which is good. I think you see. Um, positive things when you're playing at a confident level. So there's a balance there. And if they have a, a good support system around them, good coaches, good people, uh, you know, teaching them the game, ultimately it'll come together. Now, last topic here before we wrap things up. Um, I know we've seen like a different types of teams win NBA championships recently with, with the Bucks, uh, well, obviously with the Warriors this past year. And then for a long stretch, it was like LeBron and the Warriors and kind of the super team area. To contend for a championship now, what do you think are like the key things that maybe maybe people aren't thinking about, like like a good like a really good bench, or do you need a superstar, just one of them, like like they have in Giannis with um or like they have in Milwaukee with Giannis, and I know Middleton's like a really good player, but he I don't I don't think he'd be labeled like a superstar. Yeah, I think first and foremost, one of the things is lost in the, in the shuffle is defensively. Um, all of those teams you just you just referenced, they play defense at a super high level. And there's you know there's a stigma that you know NBA players and teams they don't defend. Um, some of that there, there's some creeps behind some of that, but when you start looking at the top of the league and teams that are contending for championship, championships, those got those teams are defending. Um, now for sure you got to put the basketball in, in the hole to, to put some points on the board. Um, so that they're doing that as well, um, and, and ultimately, yeah, you definitely have some need some star power out there, two or three guys who can who can get it done for you on both ends. And you, you know, like for the Bucks, for example, Giannis is clearly that guy. Chris Middleton can guard his position at a high level, and uh, one of the most underrated point guards in the, in the game, Drew Holiday, uh, he's one of my favorite players in the game. He absolutely gets it done on both ends. So um, it's no surprise to see them, and then obviously what. You know, Splash Brothers are doing Draymond Green at the forefront of what they do defensively, uh, playing that point forward position in some cases, being coming down, making plays. Uh, but ultimately, you know, those teams defend. And, and you, you're going to see more often than not teams that win a championship, they're top five, at minimum top ten in, in defensive efficiency. Uh, and and they, can, they can get it done. Obviously, you got to score it. So, uh, but if you can't stop people, you, you, don't, you don't have a ch chance to, to win a championship. It is interesting to look around the league and see, like, especially after what LeBron did going to Miami, a lot of people tried to follow that wave and make super teams. Um, but th I mean, they haven't done much. I mean, I know last year, like, special circumstances, like the Clippers, Kawhi was hurt. Um, the Lakers, obviously, Anthony Davis was hurt. And then they just had a, a poorly built team, to be quite frank with you. And then, like, the sure. Nets, the Nets, they had Kyrie playing – part-time basically but it is interesting to look at all the quote-unquote super teams and 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 how they're stacking up now with the the teams that I wouldn't consider super teams like the Celtics are basically they they drafted those two guys didn't Tatum and right. the Suns drafted uh Devin Booker and DeAndre Ayton I know they brought in Chris Paul but sure yeah I, I think uh the whole super team uh conversation and to to assume that this is a new thing um, I disagree with. Um, you, you can go back to the, to the 70s and 80s with the Celtics and the Lakers. Well, I mean, will we consider those super teams? Those teams had like four or five Hall of Famers <laughs> each. 
uh, or, or more maybe in some cases. Um, I don't, uh, you know, they're super teams. Now maybe those teams didn't, they didn't necessarily, hey, call up a guy in the summer, hey, let's all go here. But ultimately you need good players to win championships and, and quote unquote super teams have been around forever. You know, the, the Celtics, the Lakers, then you look at early 2000s, Spurs, you know, Tony Parker, Tim Duncan, David Robinson, Mono Ginobili, you know, I call that a super team as well. But maybe you can make the case of how these teams are being formed is, you know, maybe an argument. But these uh, these teams are, are, are definitely something that's been around for, for quite some time in terms of winning championships and, and getting it done. Again, the only teams that uh, it, it wouldn't be in that category but also made it to the finals would be looking at the Ron James teams in Cleveland. Mm-hmm. No doubt. And I think you know, I, I think I kind of define super teams differently just with, like I mentioned, with LeBron going to Miami, those type of teams, sure. as opposed to like I look at the Spurs as a dynasty. I think we all look at the Warriors as a dynasty now. And even sure. though even like the Jordan Bulls teams, um, they were kind of built from within. They weren't they weren't calling guys, recruiting dudes. Yeah, definitely. How the how the forms of how- or excuse me, how the team has been constructed and how they form their, their kind of their union is definitely uh, unique. Um, you know, like, for example, you, you mentioned that LeBron team in Miami. Uh, those those three guys got together. Obviously, D-Wade was already there, but Bosh and, and LeBron didn't go down there, and it's a completely different team, for sure. Mm-hmm. Like I mentioned, I'm going to wrap this thing up, but I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, best of luck in, in all that you're doing, and, and hopefully the Pacers get some wins this year. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I really do appreciate it. Let's let's do it again sometime. Yes, sir. Have a good one. Thank you. You too.